Welcome everyone. I'm Joe Galvin, Chief Research Officer at Vistage Worldwide. I'm happy to host the latest webinar in our Leading and Challenging Times series. This series provides a definitive source of thought leadership on pressing topics facing small and mid-sized businesses. Combining expert speakers like we have today with Mr. Jim Canfield and peer perspective is how we help Vistage members make critical decisions that drive growth. Today's focus is on creating a successful strategic reset in the wake of the COVID-19 disruption. Let's face it, those beautiful 2020 strategic plans we all developed, they're sitting on the shelves as COVID changed everything. What Jim's gonna to bring to us as author of CEO Tools 2.0, How to Think, Lead, and Manage Like a CEO, is a discussion on the common mistakes he sees CEOs and their teams make, and how to more effectively communicate, execute, and optimize after the showdown. So Jim, we're grateful to have you here. Um, we're looking forward to what you have to say. Let's get started. Great, thanks so much, Joe. I'm really looking forward to being with you this, more, this afternoon. So here's what I'd like to think about. For any kind of reset, any strategic reset, I want to set the, the playing field of, of a football game. And I want you to think about halftime. Here's what I want you to think about. How many coaches go into those last seconds of the half, counting down three, two, one, they look at the scoreboard. There's only one of two options. They're either ahead or behind. And I want you to think about what percentage of coaches look at the scoreboard going into halftime and just say to themselves, ah, my team knows what to do. I don't need to say anything to them. None, right? Of course, every coach is going to go into that locker room and either be ahead and talk to the team about how to stay ahead or they're behind and they're going to talk about how to get that team back on track to win the game. Well, it's the same thing with every strategic reset. Every year, mid-year, I have the clients and companies that I work with do this exact same exercise. Take a serious reset, find out where we are, and then have a conversation with the organization about whether we're ahead and how do we stay ahead, or whether we're behind, and then the conversation becomes, how do we turn things around? I'm gonna show you a couple of tools today that I think are fundamentally important to make this happen, and they're vitally important given this big reset that we're all going to experience coming out of this coronavirus COVID-19 uh, situation. I'm gonna start first with a tool that we use to help every company assess where you are at this moment. It's called the scenario planning tool. And its intention is to take incredibly complex, complicated situations and make them very simple by distilling them down to just two factors, two elements that will drive a variety of scenarios. So think about it in terms of Factor one and factor two, those are the two things that are gonna influence this situation the most. And then on the edges, we have factor, we have A, X, B, and Y, which are extremes of each of those factors. And then the four scenarios show up something like this. On the upper left, we have the scenario that combines X and A together. Then we go through a scenario with B and X, as you can see, going back to the bottom left, scenario of A and Y, and finally, B and Y. See, the nice thing about this is we're able to look at four very different scenarios. We don't even have to argue about which one is happening next. We just develop strategies for each of these scenarios. Well, it's a little more complicated than that today. As we look at how to use this tool to assess COVID-19 and what's happened to us relative to all the restrictions and regulations that we've all had to operate with them. So here's what we're gonna look at. The two factors that we found are having the most impact are number one, impact on the customer and the company. So it's either ha happening to your company directly or it's happening to your customers, which by default means it happens to you. Then number two, what's the length of time involved? Did it take a short time for this to impact your business or what happens in the short term? Or did it, is it gonna be more of a long-term effect or what happens in the long term? So let's look at it this way. Those companies that have seen a low impact on their business as a result of this COVID-19, and we see that low impact transitioning into the future, well, those are companies that are operating in a business model-driven scenario. They're companies that by the very nature of their business and how it's constructed and the model that they use, not only you're not experiencing much of a downside relative to this situation, they're actually experiencing some increases. So think companies that are digitally native. Those companies who sell, buy, provide their service offering online, they're all doing pretty well as most of us were cooped up in our homes 
or surrender or sequestered away. And those were the only places we could go for goods and services in a lot of cases. So of course, big company example would be Amazon and what they've been able to do online. But look at the ancillary effects. Just two weeks ago, Target reports an increase in their online sales of over 74%, followed by Walmart with an increase of 141%. Online was the place to be in this particular crisis. Think also about those companies whose basic business or service is delivered in a digital platform. You know, think Zoom and where we are today on GoToMeeting. You know, 60 days ago, most people had not even heard of Zoom as a tool. And I'd be willing to bet that almost everyone has used it at least once over the next couple last months. Also think about those companies that provide essential goods and services, whether it's at the grocery store, drugstore, Home Depot, and all of the companies that serve those who are providing those essential services have all seen very dramatic increases in their business at a time where others have really suffered. Let's talk about some of those who haven't been so lucky. Over on the right-hand side, these are people who have a high impact and we see that impact can, uh, actually continuing for some time into the future. This is a customer-driven scenario. These are co companies who deliver their product or service model directly to the consumer in a person-to-person -person manner, often using physical manipulation of the person to do it. Think yoga studios, gyms, massage, any kind of cosmetic procedures or surgeries. Elective surgeries of all kinds have all been eliminated virtually by the restrictions placed on the customers not being able to visit, visit that particular business. We've also seen some impact on professional service providers, accountants, attorneys, investment advisors, especially those who, in a tradition, who operated in a traditional sense and had their customers come and visit their offices. All that has been restricted. Let's look at the bottom left. Companies and businesses that have a low impact in the short term, but we're not sure about what those long-term uh, impacts will be. They could be more negative. These are project or process driven businesses. So this becomes a project or process driven scenario. Construction projects that were underway when the restrictions came are largely continuing. A couple of reasons. The work can be done. There's not a lot of impact directly or in, in a contact directly with the customer. So that work can be done just fine. Think about landscaping or pest control companies. Most of the work they do is outside of the home. They don't need direct contact with the customer so they can continue. Now, all of these companies have to consider some social distancing and, and procedures to make sure that the customers are safe when they interact, but that is a little easier to do in these businesses than, for example, in the customer-driven scenario. Last, software developers. Most of the work that they did were, was remote anyway, and they can continue to do that work pretty easily. Let's go to the bottom right. Those companies were highly impacted by this from the very beginning. Well, these are infrastructure-based businesses, infrastructure-driven scenario. Think about hotels, car uh, dealerships, restaurants. These are people who had built large infrastructure buildings, projects to deliver a few services well. So they've been particularly hard hit as those customers, other customers were restricted from going to those businesses. So once you figure out where your business lies in these scenarios or where your customers that you rely on for your product or service to be bought, where they lie in these scenarios, now we can look at strategies. So look at the other left, business model driven scenarios. For those who find yourself in that, in that uh, category, you've probably seen a very high increase in demand for your product. So the first thing we recommend there, expand capacity as quickly as possible. And not just your outbound capacity, like how do we get more product to our customers, also your inbound, making sure that you've got really robust and safe supply chains to make sure you can continue to get both the product or the raw materials that you need. Hire and train displaced workers. There's a lot of people right now who are available and, and even more we believe in the future. The latest results two weeks ago, article indicated that of all the people who have been laid off, and we know that's millions of people, it's estimated that 40% will not be going back to the jobs that they held pre-coronavirus COVID restrictions. That's gonna be a lot of really good people who are available because those jobs are going away because the company shrank, disappeared. They're just not going to be available. And those people may be very good employees for you if you can get them and train them. This is all about developing an employer brand that attracts the right people to your organization. 
Last, normally in a scenario, what we find for a client or customer who's having increased demand, one of the first things we recommend is, in, is to increase prices. That's tricky in this scenario. Since we're in a scenario where people feel a little bit disadvantaged, they can see increases in pricing as gouging or just taking advantage of those who are in a disadvantageous situation. So what we're recommending instead is hold your pricing steady, maybe even discount it a bit to show a, some good faith, and then add premium options. And be sure you've built really nice margins into these premium options with the idea being our average sale or ticket price invoice amount goes up by people choosing the premium options and you protect your margins even when you're not able to raise prices. Let's take a, the, take a look at the right hand, upper right hand scenario, that customer driven scenario. Obviously develop virtual options as quickly as possible. And, and this is a big and, like all caps, bold letters, and, and protect your margins. Be sure you're looking at your price to expense ratio as you begin to develop these virtual options. Well, give me an example of what I mean. A yoga studio found that pre-COVID, they could put people in, an, in a live in-person event in their studio for 20 to $25 per head. Gave them good margins and it was a great business model for a long time. After this all happened, of course, they went virtual as quickly as possible, only to find that the market price of an online class was in the five to $10 range, but they hadn't adjusted their expenses. So they were paying their instructors the same and, and all their other cost structure was the same. This eroded their margins really quickly and they had to work on strategies to address that, primarily around scale. Last, collect co customer information in these virtual scenarios. You know, one of the things we find is, is that in-person businesses, for whatever reason, are not that great at collecting customer data about their likes and dislikes on a regular basis. Virtual makes it so much easier. Doing that in a digital environment really works. Ask your customers when they, when they go to your online offerings, what worked? What would they like to see more of? What would they like to see less of? Is there anything else you could offer that might be valuable to them? This is very easy to do in these digital formats. Let's go to the bottom left, these project or process driven scenarios, pre-book next jobs. This is why we're a little bit bullet bearish on the long-term scenario, on the long-term future on this scenario. These companies tend to wait until the end of a project to look for the next one. And we're not so sure whether starting new projects is gonna be the first order of business for a lot of these companies, even though they're continuing on with the projects they have going on. So start working on that very early, pre-book projects, stage and stagger those projects so they have different end dates and of course make sure that you're doing any social distancing needed to protect your workers and your customers last on our infrastructure driven scenario number one repurpose infrastructure we've seen this with hotels and shopping centers who have literally converted ballrooms or stores that were that were virtually empty into medical facilities when needed We've also seen use of the rooms for recovery and even to house homeless in some areas of, of California. So repurpose that, that infrastructure. Number two, reposition your distribution model. For many years, forever, restaurants distribution model was, we went to them, we had a meal and we went home. That's all changed. Now they cook the meal, we either pick it up or it's delivered to us and we have that same experience, hopefully. Our big caveat on this one is, make sure you're protecting your brand. You know, as you begin to change your model, we, we saw a four-star restaurant who delivered to the home, same food, different experience. It came in styrofoam boxes and a plain white bag. Recommendations there, create a custom bag with a really nice logo, include uh, a really nice uh, boxes for the food itself. And then there's a phrase out of Louisiana called a lanyard. It means a little something extra. We, we suggested that the restaurant include a couple of candles, or if they didn't order dessert, maybe a small dessert offering, or maybe a, an appetizer if, if they hadn't ordered that. Something that reminds them that, hey, when you, when you have trade with us, when you have our food, when you have our brand, it's special, it's unique, and it'll be that way again when you come back. Last, consider a business model shift. We've seen this with car dealerships. Their business model for years has been the same. We sell cars. Oh, well, when you buy one, we'll service it. But service has always been a bit of a support option. Well, now sales is closed, but support is open. All of a sudden, service is front and center. In fact, I've been talking about this for over a month. 
And then last week, I saw a, a Toyota commercial. Here they were not even advertising a single car in that commercial, just talking about their service center, how important it was, how ready they were to service, and how safe it would be to, to go there. And you could see all of the, the things that they wanted us to believe were safe about going to that dealership. And oh yeah, by the way, when you're ready, we'll sell you a car too. So these are all the different scenarios that you might find yourself in, might find your customers in. Pretty interesting, isn't it, Joe? You know, it's a lot to absorb, Jim. I'm thinking about this saying, you know, okay, I'm, I'm thinking about my normal business, my pre-COVID business, and I'm thinking about where I am today. We see, we've seen almost 50% of our companies are doing a radical innovation. Is it possible for people to move from one quadrant to another or have segments of their business dealing with it here and not there? Help us, help us bring this a little more in context to, you know, we're at the bottom, we're at the bottom of COVID-19 and we're starting to claw our way out. Yeah, I think first you'd have to decide where are we now and then where are we going, right? And yes, uh, to your point, you could find yourself, parts of your business could be in different scenarios or different customer segments could be in different scenarios. You know, I think about like with Vistage, for example, through no, no choice of ours, both speakers and Vistage and members, we all had to visit that upper right scenario. We had to go virtual as quickly as possible and then deliver all the value we could deliver in a virtual option. And I'm, I'm really proud to be part of that community because I think uh, you and, and everyone involved have done a great job with that. And now coming out, you have to say, all right, where do we go from here? What's it going to look like as this particular scenario begins to unfold as we move forward? How do we bring it back to what it, to some of the elements that it was and not lose some of the great elements that we've learned about during this, during this shutdown? Well, the first thing when, whenever we need to talk about a strategic reset, and this goes back to the very basics, is to set direction. Every person that works for you and works in your company needs to hear three things from you as the leader on a regular and ongoing basis. And these three things, if you don't get anything else from this little webinar, get this piece. Every person needs to hear on a regular and repeated basis, where are we headed? How are we gonna get there? And what are we tracking? to know when we're on and off track. Where are we headed? How are we gonna get there? And what are we tracking to know when, we're on, when we are on and off track? Now, for those of you who are listening closely, you're noticing I don't say if we're on and off track, I say when, because literally we're always off track. We're a little ahead or a little behind. We're a lot ahead or a lot behind. And this is how we make sure we can get back on track. What do you Jim, think, where, we're, where we're headed is the money question these days, right? It's not just where is my business headed, but where, where are we collectively going through this corona experience? That level of uncertainty certainly has to uh, create anxiety at a minimum and, and complicate this further. Well, there's no question. And as we reopen, as we reset, remember some of those scenarios, those businesses are already in a robust upturn. So we've got to keep articulating to our people what we're doing as an organization based on higher customer demand on some of the businesses who've been shut down or, or whose business has been negatively affected, they've got to tell their people, what are our plans going forward? Listen, the only thing I'm sure about right now is to assume that it's business as usual and none of your employees are going to have any anxiety about reopening and restarting and coming back to the office. That's the only scenario I'm certain is not going to work. Talking about where we're headed, this is a reconfiguration, a restatement of our strategy. Even though a lot has changed, strategically, we might be headed in the similar direction that we've headed in before. And if not, then we need to rewrite those scripts right now and make sure that everyone in our organization knows. Remember, strategy is where we're headed over the next two to three years. They're directional objectives that tell the rest of the organization where we're headed, the direction we're going. And then as you can see, tactics is a part of this. These are the steps we're going to take to get there. Generally speaking, we design tactics over a one year horizon, 12 months, time bound for that period of time. Right now, we'd say, what are our tactics in between now and the end of the year? What are we going to do to advance our strategies? And again, if strategies are directional objectives like increase revenues and remain profitable, then our, then our tactics would need to support that. If it has something to do with creating a employer brand to attract the very best people, then our tactics over the next six months should reflect that. How we'll get there, these are the priorities and actions we're gonna take week to week, month to month, and thereby quarter by quarter. They're the specific steps we're going to take and getting highly aligned around these is important. 
A tool we use, for example, around priorities is a quarterly priority manager. And then we review that each month to make sure that all the team members have their own priorities set, no more than five, and that they're crystal clear about what actions to take to advance those particular priorities. And last, what are we tracking? This all comes down to metrics, key performance indicators or KPIs, and goals. How do people know what numbers are important? Because see, when we've got the right numbers, then what we see is that they can see how a change in behavior creates a new result, and then they know right away if that result is consistent with the goals and objectives we've, we've laid out. A scoreboard, if you will, to let people know how what they're doing scores or how it weighs in. And then last, create an effective reward system. See, it's very important to have people in an organization not only know where to go and what to do and what we're tracking. Along the way, they need a little bit of re-encouragement. They need some appreciation. In fact, what we found in the case study companies that we studied for, for CEO Tools 2.0 was that there was a direct correlation between the success of the company, how successful they were, and my measure of success is threefold. Yes, financial, in terms of growing revenues and profitable revenues, but number two, are people happy here? Do they stay? Are, do they describe themselves as being engaged? And customers, are our customers fans? Do they buy more? Are they excited to be our customers? Do they provide referrals? And the companies that I saw who were the most successful were the ones who had the most effective reward systems. Now, as I started to study these reward systems, every one of them had the same three elements. Rewards, recognition, and appreciation. Now, I know it sounds a bit like I'm saying the same thing three different ways, but each one of these are unique and they each have their own characteristics. Let's take a look at appreciation. It's typically one person to another. It's oftentimes verbal. It's really just a gesture of gratitude, thank you, for the contribution someone's made. It could be in writing, it's usually short and sweet, like an email or a text, or my personal favorite, the handwritten note. Just for a second, I want you to think about something. How many of you out there have a handwritten note that you received sometime in the past, and even though it's been a while, you're still hanging on to it? I've traveled all over the world and asked that question hundreds and hundreds of times, and literally thousands of people raise their hand and say, I've got one. I've had it for three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. Nothing else has that kind of impact. I want you to make a to-do note for yourself right now to write a handwritten note to someone in your organization or maybe a customer or a vendor who really stepped up over the last few months and send them a note of thank you, gratitude, and appreciation. Let's jump up to rewards. Rewards have all the elements of appreciation and they have something valuable attached to them. It's usually cash. Any kind of incentive, bonus, commissions, anything that's over and above base pay falls in this category of reward. And what we found over time, I found it myself in the companies I ran, non-cash compensation works better than cash as a motivator. You've probably had the experience of giving a cash bonus and then realizing the shelf life on it was kind of short, like the excitement seemed to go away pretty quickly. There's a couple of psychological reasons for this. Number one, when you give me that cash, I'm excited about it. But once I put your cash with my cash, I can no longer differentiate your cash from my cash. In other words, when I look at it, it's all just cash. So my excitement about the fact that it came from you goes away pretty quickly. However, if you give me a big screen TV that's worth the, the same amount you would have paid me in cash, I'll never differentiate that TV from you. Every time I watch it, I'll remember where it came from. Frankly, every time I even walk past it, I'll remember it came from you. Last is recognition. It's actually the most important of the three. Recognition also has all the elements of appreciation. It also has something tangible attached to it. The reality is it's not very valuable. In some cases, it has little or no value, but it has something better. It has meaning. And when you can provide meaning in the lives of those people who work with and for you, they will be loyal to you, they will stay with you, 
and they'll provide that incremental, incremental and discretionary effort that we all need to be successful. See, these take the form of a recognition, a plaque, an award, something that says, remember, you matter around here. I walked into one of the case study companies and they had done a great job with this. They had something called a star award. Talk about not having much value, it was pretty much a piece of paper, big yellow star, says star at the top. It told who it went to and who gave it to them and why. How do I know those things were important around that company? Because when I walked around that company, the cubicles and offices were wallpapered with those star awards. See, it meant something. There was a source and sense of pride for having to receive that award. Now, it was also very special because it was a peer-to-peer -peer award. See, inside of companies, we have an expectation that we're gonna get some recognition from the people we work for, but when we get it from the people we work with, that makes it even more special. So when companies have these three programs in place inside their organization to form an effective reward system, people really took, a, took notice of it. Now, let me tell you, because it sounds like these are a lot of my opinions, let me put some facts behind it. Joe, I know you always love facts and figures. Listen to this. Last year, one of the world's largest HR consulting companies, OC Tanner, did a big survey. They studied people who had left their job over the last 12 months. They wanted to know why. 85% of those surveyed left their job because they didn't receive the recognition or appreciation they felt they deserved for the work that they had done. 85%. And of those, 65% said they didn't get one word of recognition or appreciation over the last year. This is a low bar. Pretty amazing, isn't it, Joe? Yeah, you know, Jim, I wanted to jump in and ask you about this because yeah. this, is a, this is important in all scenarios. But now we've gone through this traumatic corporate event. Many people have had to lay people off. Friends are furloughed. Friends are out of jobs. You know, this really becomes even more important when you think about it in this, in the context of where we are today in this COVID experience. I, I think so, Joe. I think that the ability for a leader today to show empathy in the form of rewards, recognition, and appreciation. Think about those people who really stepped up or really took, had a big sacrifice during these last couple of months and making sure that they're being recognized, making sure there are some appropriate rewards and just good old fashioned appreciation where you just say thank you. There's a famous line from literature that says, men live lives of quiet desperation. Ladies, I'm pretty sure it was written a long time ago. I know they included all of us. What are they desperate for? What are we desperate for? Appreciation, that someone comes along and says, great job, thank you so much, pat on the back. Thank you. And we all have the ability to do that same thing. Let me leave you with one last thought along those lines. Sometimes the people who work with and for us, and I would say right now more than any other time, can be wandering around thinking, does anybody care? Does any of this matter? Does it even mean anything? When I hear big picture questions like that, I'm reminded of a book I particularly like called Man's Search for Meaning. It's by Viktor Frankl. He wrote it about his experiences during World War II in the concentration camps. And he said, when we heard people questioning life, those big picture questions like I just mentioned, he said, we could see it in their eyes. They'd lost hope. And within a day or a week or so, they'd be gone. This is just a reminder that sometimes the biggest and best tool we have at our disposal is to instill hope in the people that work with and for us. Let them know that you care they work for you and nothing does it better than that reward system. Let them know that the work they do matters and that it means something. It means something to you, to your customers, to their fellow employees. I hope I've been able to share something that makes a difference for you today. Thanks so much for having me. Um, Jim, it's great to have you with us. Appreciate your thoughts about, about going through the, the scenario planning models. Uh, that you set out and, and really closing this concept of hope. It, it's clear that, that we all have hopes and that, that hope's important. And it's clear we got some, some work to do as we go into this. So let me ask you a few questions before we close yeah. this out, yeah. uh, because that's always, you know, where people learn. Leaders learn by taking your concepts, bringing it into the, bringing it into their group and then discussing that. So hopefully we'll do some of that. Um, and I think this is probably true is that is for a lot of leaders, um, they find themselves in a scenario they've never encountered before. 
So you go back to your scenarios and we've been very comfortable long term. We've been in this role. It's worked out really great. And now all the rules have been changed. How do you adapt to that? What is it that, uh, you know, how do leaders, what steps should they take to begin to understand that? I guess is my question. Yeah. No, that's a great question. I, I think in the face of any change, and this is certainly a big one, um, the same three rules apply. In fact, I had a simple cheat sheet that I would use whenever my team came to me and they wanted to implement meaningful change inside the organization. There was a three-step formula I would follow. And you, you probably have seen it um, in the book, Joe. It's communicate, execute, and optimize. So what are we saying there? Step one, communicate. What do we need to communicate and how? What do we need to communicate and how? I say that a couple of times because I think we get the first part right. In fact, maybe even spend too much time on what to communicate. It's the how that I think we fall down on somewhat because by how, I don't mean how do we wordsmith it. What I mean is, what's the ongoing pattern of regular communication that has the message sink in and get its desired result? And I think too often we set this bar way too low. I think we set it up, did they hear it and understand it? The bar we need to see is, did we see a change in behavior that creates a new result? And now is that result consistent with the goals, objectives, or direction we've laid out? Then we get to, no, we get to number two, yeah, execute. Sounds like what we want people to do. But people are doing things. We have to have metrics that tell us whether the, the work that they're doing is consistent with the goals we've laid out. Last is optimize. How do we keep it going over time? And that's where this motivation, this intrinsic motivation that we were describing around success and, and celebrating successes really kicks in. And coaching, really coaching your team members at this point, not only as we normally do to higher levels of performance, but also being an empathetic coach to listen for people who may be struggling or who may have had some personal impacts as a result of what we've all gone through. Thank you, that was excellent, right? You know, the other part of this now is, is about metrics, right? How do leaders know which metrics are the right, right ones to measure? What we measured before um, in the pre-COVID world and what we measure now, have those metrics changed? And more importantly, how am I gonna know when things have changed and I can start to, to double down and bring people back maybe or go after more customers? How do we know we're starting to, to climb out of this? It's a great question. One of the things is I start to work with companies to develop metrics, Joe, I see that a pattern that, that shows up over and over. And that pattern is most of the metrics people are tracking are financial and they're monthly. Nothing wrong with that, right? That's a great start, but financial monthly metrics have a similar characteristic to P&Ls. Great look back, right? Tells us a lot about what we've accomplished, but not so great about giving us real-time feedback about how we're doing right now and where we're likely to be headed in the future. So the first thing I challenge companies to think in terms of is greater frequency. What can be, you be tracking every week, every day that gives you an early indication of whether we're back on the right track? So the first thing I would tell companies is to make sure that you're tracking in the shortest terms possible to get meaningful data. And then feed that back to people. And by the way, that's a great basis for recognition, appreciation, and even rewards is when people are hitting those numbers daily and weekly, because that's gonna give us the clearest picture about whether we're on the right track. And then move outside of financial. Track operational metrics, those that measure increases in efficiency or effectiveness. Effectiveness being, are we getting better at something? Measures of quality, quantity, anything that says we're getting more of what we want and less of what we don't want. And efficiency being, do we have our mix right of expenses to revenue? Uh, you know, one I would be tracking right now, if it were me, Joe, is I would definitely be on revenue to total headcount. And look at that ratio, and, and you could probably do that historically over the last nine, 12 months, take a look at what that ratio has been typically, and then look at what that revenue should be now based on your current revenue. And then as revenues either increase or decrease, you can make the changes needed to, to make those choices. And then tracking customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and make sure people, especially right now as they're coming back to work, that they're not feeling overly anxious and that's showing up in a lack of satisfaction. And then we can even find some metrics that would be outside of our industry that might give us an indication of where we're headed. Okay, great, thank you. You know, one of the phenomena of this experience has been the work from home. How companies yeah. have radically just, just in, you know, in 30 days, they went from being all in to being virtually connected. And you talk, so I wanna connect now the dots of your reward system as part of a culture. How do you maintain that idea of recognition and culture when you're now in a virtual environment? And yeah. some people will come back in smaller groups, and others come back, but we're gonna be in this hybrid world till we get to the other side of this. Help us understand that. 
Yeah, I think it even becomes more important, you know, because here's the thing, particularly there are three scenarios, right? Everybody comes back to work, and, and I know that this is going to oversimplify it, but everybody comes back to the same place they've always come back to work. The other side of the coin would be everyone stays remote. Turns out we can do it, so we're going to keep it that way. But the scenario I think that you're probably alluding to that we, we will probably see, at least in the short term, some people have come back to a central facility and others are remote. And I think that recognition piece really kicks in here because I know for, from having been a remote person where everybody else worked in an office, it's really easy to think that you're just you know, lone man out or lone woman out and making sure that you're looping those people in and they're not just a voice on a phone or the only person on a, on a virtual uh, meeting uh, all the time and making sure that you're, you're weighing in with their input. Those are other little small ways to make sure people are appreciated, they feel heard. So I think, I think right now, making sure that those people who are the least connected to any kind of central facility are the ones being taken care of. There's a famous line about this that I particularly like. It's from Andy Grove. You probably remember him, CEO and, and chairman at Intel. Andy would go to great pains to have phone calls with the people who were farthest away from his office. He would call Singapore in the middle of the night. And the reason he gave was, he said, the snow always melts first at the edges. So he wanted to touch those parts of the organization that were farthest away from headquarters. They saw things, heard things, and felt things that the people in the headquarters were often insulated to. Excellent, thank you. Um, this leads to our last question, and it leads to the handout. Um, I appreciate you providing a handout for everybody, but it talks about the mistakes that you see CEOs make from emerging crisis. Can you help us set that up, and, and this will motivate folks to download this and spend a few more minutes thinking about this once we're done. Yeah, I think for those who have read uh, read my book, they'll probably get a chuckle out of it because honestly, I took the seven steps that we recommend every CEO take their to lead their business better and we turned them around, but it's really true. Instead of setting direction, Joe, they just don't. They assume that people know what to do. And especially in a, in a time of crisis and chaos, and, and I don't mean to overblow this, crisis to me is something we didn't expect. It showed up on our doorstep and we have to deal with it. And chaos is what you mentioned. We don't really know what's going on and we certainly don't know what happens next. And people need to hear authentic and honest verbalization of that. You know, second is when there's not an ongoing dialogue to establish trust with and, and the people who work with and for us. I see that those who lack metrics as an underlying principle of the business, so when they stop tracking metrics or they don't make those metrics available, particularly now, you know, a lot of times, Joe, you've probably seen this, when the numbers don't look good. We don't really want to share them. I can tell you from my own experience, nothing rises or raises trust faster than when you share bad news in a way that people can relate to and, and ask for their help. You know, not coaching people uh, in times of, of crisis can be problematic. Relying on a few individuals rather than having processes and systems. And the last one is probably obvious when you don't celebrate successes. Find those easy, easy early wins and recognize people for them. And what we've included in the, in the packet that anyone can, can get from you, Joe, is, is those seven steps I go into detail about those seven mistakes that I see companies make. And look, nobody makes all seven, but we all make a few. I do too almost every day. And then what I did is I gave you a planning sheet for these seven steps to say what actions will we, we take over the next weeks and months to get back on track and then Almost with everything I say, who's responsible and by when? Those are my two favorite uh, favorite <laughs> lines to hold people accountable for actually taking those actions. Well, Jim, thank you. That is a great way to close out this session with you. I can see why you were the speaker of the year and appreciate all your insights and, and the thoughts. And, and really that framework is something to really stop and think about. So again, thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights. We greatly appreciate it. And thank you uh, and thank you for the handout. I invite everyone to take that handout, download it and work on it. And we thank all everyone who's uh, attending this uh, for your time and your attention. Hopefully it made you think about a few things. We'll look forward to seeing you on our next Leading and Challenging Times webinars. Thanks again, Jim. And goodbye, everybody.